This afternoon, I think uh, I think the consensus is this, the, this morning went very well. So thanks again to the speakers and to, to Anne. Uh, so we have four speakers this afternoon. Our first speaker will be Lisa Ackerman, who's uh, currently executive vice president and chief operating officer for the World Monuments Fund. I think most of us remember very fondly uh, uh, Lisa's time at the Crest Foundation in, in her broad view of funding. So thank you for all the support <laughs> over the years. Um, our second speaker will be Grace Jan. Uh, Grace is a uh, assistant Chinese paintings conservator. And essentially, it's a little bit of the embodiment of what this conference is trying to be about and that she's had conservation training both in, in Western uh, approaches and in uh, uh, Asian uh, conservation uh, methods and, and ideas. Uh, she did her degree at New York University Institute of Fine Arts Conservation Center, had some internships at the Metropolitan Museum, Museum of Fine Arts Boston. She was at the Shanghai Museum and uh, the uh, Palace Museum as well. Um, so uh, Grace will be our second speaker, so welcome. Uh, Simon Warwick is here. Simon is a, a conservator in private practice, has a, a very um, uh, broad-ranging uh, uh, international practice, um, and has been uh, working at Encore since uh, 1994, but he's, and he's currently based in Rome. Um, he also, more recently, has taken over um, uh, being the course coordinator for uh, the stone conservation uh, course that's run through the International Conservation Center in Rome. So again, um, Simon, welcome and thanks for coming. And finally, um, John G. Waite, better known as Jack Waite, um, also one of our own. It was Fitch's first assistant, if, uh, if I got that right, Jack, uh, going, going way back as a student. Uh, Jack has just been on flagship projects uh, since his time uh, at Columbia, including the Rotunda at UVA, the Tweed Courthouse, and I could probably name 98 or 100 other important buildings that uh, you've worked on, as well as the Statue of Liberty. So uh, all four of you, thanks for agreeing to speak. And uh, Lisa, you're going to start it off for us. Well, I, I actually think that George um, gave me a great segue into my talk, but also it wasn't my broad view of funding. I think the board's astonishment was my broad view of Europe, because I was supposed to be managing a program that was European art from antiquity to the 19th century, and that managed for me to include just about every place on the planet. So I, um, I think they gave me a lot of marks for my creativity. I should also say that since, you know, this is... Um, very much um, a Columbia audience, that that picture that has been up on the poster, the image on the left is actually Glenn Bernaysian, a graduate of the program, um, working at the churning of the Sea of Milk Gallery in Angkor. So um, certainly um, an encounter of East and West um, for Glenn in the many years he's worked at the site. Um, Norman Weiss took me to task for suggesting that there was anything beyond mortar in the preservation world. And, um, and so um, I hope that Norman, by the end of the talk, will think that I've done justice to why I wanted to talk about more than just the physical aspects of what we do. And when I started to think about the East-West confrontation and how this affects us today, it really got me thinking about when we practice preservation today, you know, where did we come from in a certain sense? And there have been east-west encounters really since time began. And, um, you know, in 17th and 18th and 19th century grand European homes, it was very popular to have a Chinese room or a Turkish room. So from an art historical sense, we know how much that east-west confrontation affected taste over time. Um, certainly in places like Ani in Turkey, a great crossroads in the Middle Ages of um, East-West thought in terms of scholarship and literature and um, religion. And the trade routes really brought these encounters into constant focus in those eras, and we've somewhat forgotten that. And I think that when I think about how we've evolved, um, certainly in Europe and the United States, our preservation activities are largely a function of 19th century thinking. It's a lot of what came out of the grand tour, the experience of travel, the experience of collecting, also a kind of scientific approach 
Um, the notion that a lot of the museums that we love today were started in the 19th century, and in many ways, it was about creating collections of specimens, whether it was works of art or encyclopedic collections of Italian art or natural history museums. In many ways, that the preservation movement grew out of that, and um, things like the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings in England, which still exists today. I mean, again, we can have great debates about whether we prize the romantic ruin or we can scientifically investigate things and recreate them. And in many ways, not just in the East-West dialogue, but in our own preservation activities, fixing things is often the easiest piece of what we do. It's articulating why we're there doing it that is the toughest part. And I think, um, as I said earlier during the comments section, that I think the Industrial Revolution plays a big part in how the preservation movement began, and also the destruction in Europe of World War I and World War II. And what I'm showing you here is something called the Tempio Malatestiano in Rimini, um, considered Alberti's first great commission, considered in many ways by art historians the beginning of the Italian Renaissance architecture movement. And it was bombed three times during World War II. Bombed so heavily that the entire facade moved away from the building. And there was, ooh, sorry, a substantial gap between the main building and the facade. And there was no doubt that this was a building that needed to be reconstructed. And the roof burned, the apse, and one of the bombings took the apse out. Um, like many buildings, a lot of the decorative elements had been moved to safe quarters. They were not bombed. But the painting campaign that had been a great hallmark of the interior was completely gone, and it was not reconstructed. I should say that 80% of the buildings in Rimini were bombed during World War II. But if you went there today, it's a very cohesive place, um, a great place to live as well as to visit. This is what it looked like in 2000, the 50th anniversary of the rededication of what's now the cathedral in Rimini, but originally um, a private chapel built for the Malatesta family. So um, a building that was completely reconstructed, and we don't take issue with that. You know, there was, it was perfectly defensible to do that. Again, looking at World War II, Coventry Cathedral, known to many people um, as a great symbol of reconciliation, um, the first major incendiary bomb in England, during World War II, clearly the um, medieval church was destroyed very soon after the modern edition was created. And it's often cited as one of these great examples of preservation dealing with the old and the new. It actually turned up on the um, 2012 World Monuments Watch uh, because the new building is in good shape. The old building is much visited as an architectural ruin. Unfortunately, there was no maintenance done for about 50 years because it was considered something that didn't need maintenance. But of course, all of these elements that used to be interior spaces were now exterior. And this just to show that Coventry, like Rimini, was a town that was substantially bombed during the war. And so this area around the cathedral is the sort of medieval core surrounded by a 20th century town um, that's a, still today a growing, thriving town. So today, really, the challenge is coming to terms with this whole complex of medieval buildings. So one of the efforts that ensued soon after the watch listing was indeed a lot of people rallying behind and beginning the physical conservation of the remains. One of the great discoveries was that forgotten to everybody was before the war started, all of the medieval stained glass was taken out of the church, put into storage, in vaults, and it had essentially been completely forgotten. So as part of this conservation program, it was discovered that there were thousands of pieces of stained glass in storage, which we've now helped to work with a local group to restore. And now the issue is what do you do with it? Because it's clearly not going back into its original place. So there's hopefully going to be a small museum created on site that will house the stained glass. But I think, again, you know, this is one of these issues that we still grapple with, whether it's east or west, is how to come to terms. Um, even in a site that's very well known, here we are 
60 years later, 70 years later, dealing with the discovery of something important and how do we reconcile what it means to display it and how do we interpret it. From the organization that I work for, World Monuments Fund, one of the most galvanizing influences for us was a year after we were founded, the floods of 1966 in Venice and Florence, but Venice especially because our founder was living in the Veneto region and um, literally because he was an engineer by training, he was just brought into the dialogue about what to do. And I think again in the same notion that um, the preservation movement particularly in that era was about solving physical problems, Colonel Gray's efforts in behalf of World Monuments Fund were not just to give money to restore buildings, but to create something called the Misericordia Conservation Lab that still exists today as a major research center for conservation of stone. And I think that they were able, there was a very dramatic outpouring of concern, and they were able to raise a lot of money, but the difference between 1965 and now is if I were to show you all of World Monuments Fund pictures of the floods of 1966, there is not a person in those images. It's all about the buildings, and I think where the East-West confrontation becomes most interesting is we really have evolved as a field to be much more concerned about what the impact is beyond the physical conservation aspect of this. So this is just an example of one of what became about 25 projects that WMF took on in that era. And again, I can show you beauty shot after beauty shot, and there's really no discussion about the people engaged in the work. It really is very much about restoring the beauty and drama of these places. So that brings me to Angkor Wat, which has factored into WMF's life uh, since 1989, when WMF was invited by the then transitional Cambodian government to come on an exploratory mission to try and develop a conservation program, which we started in 1991 and started at a monastery called Preah Khan and began a training program that started off with about 20 people and from then to now, we've probably had about 200 people work with us at four temple sites. And while we're very proud of that work, if you look at what the Western sort of first knowledge of Cambodia was, it was really all through the eyes of the French Institute of the Far East, um, the École Française d'Extrême Orient, um, which exists in Paris today, a hundred year plus organization, um, has a number of outposts, including one in Siem Reap. And to understand Angkor, one of the best things one can do is go to their library. But again, it's very much in that kind of European age of discovery systematic notion of cataloging all of these places. So there are enormous numbers of photographs, drawings, descriptions of seeing the sites, but very much with an eye only about the physical encounters with the buildings. So this is actually um, uh, an aerial photo that was taken uh, in 1910 of Phnom Bacane, which is one of the oldest temples at Angkor. Um, and if we think we've come really, really far, this is a photo from last year when LIDAR was done at Angkor. So a hundred years later, we're taking a different kind of aerial photograph, but we still, in many ways, um, have that impulse to try and catalog all that we can. And the LIDAR is obviously very different than the aerial photographs of the 19-teens and tells us much more than we could. But um, it was interesting you know, to realize that a hundred years later, we're not really doing all that much different than what the um, French were doing. Where I think World Monuments Fund and many uh, other organizations, as we heard earlier today, try and be not just good preservation professionals, but really good citizens of the world, when we work on sites like this, it really is about trying to understand the local needs and, um, and the local capacity. And I think that many Western organizations, mine included, talk about our work as capacity building locally. And you know, what does that mean? In the case of 
the work we've done, I mean, it's meant obviously raising money in order to keep people employed and um, to keep their professional skills up. Um, in the case of Angkor, when we talk about East-West, it's again still driven through a Western lens in a lot of ways because um, when the Khmer Rouge period ended and the transitional government was looking to try and grapple with restoring Angkor, turning it into an asset for the country, it was also very much with the notion of working with UNESCO and other groups. So the goal for many people around the world, whether this is good or bad is not really the issue, but many people see becoming a World Heritage Site as the gold standard. Um, there are many reasons why I would argue, you know, Babylon's gonna be famous whether it's a World Heritage Site or not, um, but nonetheless, we have created a culture where we believe that, you know, being part of something called outstanding universal values is good. So, um, right away in the early 90s, uh, UNESCO sort of fast-tracked a World Heritage nomination for Angkor and set up an international coordinating committee that has met uh, twice a year, every year um, in December. There'll be a 20th anniversary celebration so it's an interesting question about what is East and West, what is West because much of the field is still driven in many ways by a Western notion of how we catalog and care for these buildings. Um, and I struggled a lot with, you know, what does Angkor mean? And, you know, I think one of the things that happens when mass tourism comes and, you know, Angkor was a tourist spot centuries ago, as was Venice, as was almost any place we can name. But I think one of the, the advent of mass tourism has meant we have few intimate encounters with space. And when I think about what drives us differently and whether it's east-west, I mean, there's also, you know, north and south as differences too, because, um, you know, where is Africa and South America in this discussion? But you know, it's that intimacy that we often lose. And I feel like when I look at many of our projects outside of the Western world, what we often do see is a much more intimate engagement with these places um, that we often see only as tourist places. And I can even say when I was in Rome a few years ago with a friend, uh, a friend was actually annoyed when we went into a church and there was a wedding going on because you know, she couldn't see the paintings she wanted to see. And, you know, you think to yourself, well, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, it's good that there's a wedding going on in this church. So, um, you know, what is the encounters when we're abroad? And I think that, like everybody in this room, you know, you, you want to be sensitive to local practice. And we do tend, on the Western side of the scale, to have a kind of scientific, professional approach. And, um, you know, if I've learned anything about some of our work in Asia, um, in particular, it's, and Africa too, for that matter, it's that there are rituals associated with working at these sites, which we have to understand are equally as important as taking humidity measurements and and all, and this was actually, we were erecting scaffolding, and you know, the workers were very adamant that we needed to wait several days for the right auspicious occasion, and we also needed to have a ceremony to bless the scaffolding before it was erected. And you know, that is not a quaint practice or um, something that we should comment on from an anthropological standpoint, it literally is just the normal course of business and an important element of it. Um, and again, you know, this idea about the very intimate way people encounter Angkor, and two million tourists a year ago there, 500,000 of them are Cambodians, and for many Cambodians, it's not just a tourism destination, there is still a desire to recognize their ancestors and make certain kinds of offerings. And so that's very prevalent when you're at the site, um, not in the highest of tourist seasons. So just a reminder that these are religious sites. And I think that, you know, more so than on the preservation side, but on the tourism side, I think we've done a bad job of reminding people that often 
what they see as a tourist destination is really a very sacred space. And I think that's something that, you know, uh, just as maybe renaming the preservation field, it's also expanding our ideas of what our jobs really are. And I think we're really, really good at the physical conservation piece of it, and we're not so good at always offering the best advice about how to manage tourism and how to educate tourists, because tourists shouldn't be demonized, but they aren't always given the right tools to appreciate the space the right way. And um, it was mentioned earlier about, you know, the tourist impact on a place like Angkor. This is sunset at Phnom Bikain, and this is a light tourist day. About 10,000 tourists a day go up during the high season from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And trying to convince people that they should go spread out through the whole day is the major lost cause uh, of my life anyway. But, um, you know, trying to convince people that if they went at 8 in the morning and were there all by themselves, they would have a great view. <laughs> they don't have to be there at sunset. And, um, and, you know, and what is this doing to, you know, why are we conserving a temple if it's just going to be trampled? And, and I think that this is also frustrating to many of the Cambodians with whom we work, that they see people just acting badly on the site. So trying to educate tourists of the future, I think, should also be a preservation goal. We had um, an experience in Kyoto a few years ago where the Japan Society here in New York organized a delegation from Kyoto. And they came to New York because they were specifically interested in the phenomenon in America of the historic district. And they were trying to understand how historic districts had come to be and how was it that you could have a place like New York where there was a historic district and right in the middle of the historic district there were new buildings. So um, the Japan Society helped them meet a lot of people um, in Washington, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, and they set up a three-day symposium. And I think one of the most moving examples of why this is more than just about the physical conservation piece is the woman who runs the Kyoto Community Conservation Center who is interested in saving the traditional machia, which you see on the right. But she really gave a very poetic explanation that it was not just about the buildings for her. She saw what was happening in Kyoto with um, this mass destruction of the traditional building fabric as the erosion of the national soul. And, you know, she's a woman of about 40. This isn't somebody who's 80 lamenting um, something from her childhood. She really saw it as because of globalization and because of rising wealth throughout Asia, you know, what she saw is people not learning certain tea ceremonies anymore, people not having certain kinds of kitchen gardens anymore, people not wearing traditional wedding gowns because they wanted to wear a Western style wedding gown. And not that she denied anybody's right to live life however they wanted, but she began to question what does it mean to be Japanese as you chip away um, at these examples. And I thought that her um, discussion with us about the machia and about um, historic districts was very interesting because her goal was not to save every machia in Kyoto. I mean, her goal was to try and save a representative couple of blocks so that people would still have the understanding that this had been um, like the tenement building here in New York. I mean, this had been a way people lived for hundreds of years. And she could understand why people wanted to live in modern housing, but she couldn't understand why people wanted all the other things to go with it that were, as far as she was concerned, on a certain path. And then I was thinking, you know, um, this east-west encounter, um, these are Moai from Easter Island in 1967, and I was thinking WMF has long had an advocacy program, and its engagement with Easter Island really was a pure advocacy effort. There was going to be a jet refueling station built on Easter Island that basically was going to drive a run runway down through the most fragile uh, parts of the island. And, you know, we think today, how could that even have come up as an idea? But um, it, was, it was well on its way to happening, and why Colonel Gray, um, as a one-man band, decided he was going to fight this effort. 
Um, but he managed, and this we would never sanction today, but he managed to get a Moai from Easter Island to New York City and put it on Park Avenue in front of the Seagram Building and had a major press conference about the travesty that would befall the world if that runway was built. And it was a successful uh, endeavor. Um, and then we continued to work on Easter Island on and off on management plans and some conservation activities. But, you know, again, e tourists go here too. The tourist population from 1970 to now has increased tenfold, and it takes its toll. So one of the recent developments there was to try and create paths so that people would learn to be gentle on the earth um, when they visited Easter Island, because of course with all the tourists come trash and um, tourists need to go to the bathroom and when you're an island nation that becomes a major um, issue. So developing, you know, self-composting toilets that could be positioned appropriately on the island, teaching people that what they thought were rocks were actually petroglyphs and they needed to get away from them. And so I think, you know, it's an interesting thing because you know, Easter Island really is absolutely dead center between the Eastern and Western worlds. Um, but it's struggling with the same issues that we all do, which is managing tourism. And I felt I couldn't leave without at least acknowledging um, Africa also has, um, you know, a very different approach to heritage conservation. Um, but it's also facing rising tourism. And these are the churches, 11 churches in Lalibela that were built in the Middle Ages, um, cut right into live rock. So they have an enormous range of conservation issues. Um, they also are the major pilgrimage site for um, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. They were built originally to be a new Jerusalem because at the time it was perceived that there would be no chance to make pilgrimages to the Holy Land. So this was going to be, you know, a, a nexus for, um, you know, Europeans and Africans and others to come to a major pilgrimage site. What brought up, we were working there in the 1960s and 70s. Um, what brought us back was this is how you experience the 11 churches. You uh, come upon them in the landscape. Uh, and this, again, you know, the difference when decisions are made, not locally. In the mid-2000s, the European Union said, we hear that there are problems at the churches of Lalibela. We want to protect them. We're going to give you 60 million euros to put shelters over them. That sounds like a great idea. The only problem is the shelters do not remotely address the issue because the European Union officers who made this decision completely misunderstood what the issue is at Lalibela. So the issue at Lalibela is groundwater saturation being brought up through capillary action into the walls of the churches. The shelters protect from rainwater, which is great, except in Ethiopia, rainwater is actually not the issue. And this <laughs> merely adds weight and exacerbates the problem because it actually traps the groundwater even further. So UNESCO and World Monuments Fund together put up quite a fight being called all sorts of unkind names, I should say, but we managed to get them to stop when they'd only put the shelters on six churches. Um, our hope is they're so badly built, they'll just go away eventually. But, you know, it's not just that they misunderstood the conservation experience. It's that they misunderstood the whole experience of encountering these 11 churches in the landscape, not caged in this way, where you com it completely changes the experience of being there. And we're working with a team of people. And again, the conservation piece of this could be described as very Western because these are university students, many of them with architecture and engineering degrees who are interested in heritage. Some of them actually work for the Ethiopian church because we wanted a team that was actually going to be able to be a local workforce. So they're using international conservation practices. But what we're really aiming for is to reestablish that intimacy that ability to stand at those churches and worship as this woman is, or to encounter them. This is the major tourist destination in the country. But you, those, those shelters not only misunderstand the physical needs, but you know, the psychic and spiritual needs, which I think it is our job to try and be an advocate 
for that piece of it as well. When I was still struggling with what is East and West and you know, what are the differences, if any, and I looked at the World Monuments Watch to see if that would give me guidance, and it really didn't because what it told me was we've seen for many, many years that modern sites are at great risk and coming down at an alarming rate. And this year, what it really showed was industrial sites, what we do with the legacy of the 19th century and early 20th century, and these buildings that are often iconic in our minds. And many of them are simply going to meet the wrecking ball. Um, in Mexico, interestingly, they've turned this blast furnace site into a major public park in Monterey, which is a fantastic thing in a very densely populated city with a lack of green space. It's a good solution, but that didn't really help me with the East-West confrontation. And I began to look at some other sites, and I came back again and again to really our origins as a field push us towards the monumental. So we think about you know, the churches of Lalibela, or we think about um, Venice, and we think about Rimini Cathedral. But you know, in, a, in many ways, what I think we lack sometimes with our scientific approach is that in, if there were an Eastern approach to it, it's that it's a much more integrated thought process about the landscape, the built heritage, the intangible. And for most people in the field, it's sometimes a struggle to see all those married together. And so as I looked at this more and more, I thought, do we need sometimes to just step away from our professional training and just look more carefully at what we encounter in the world? And you know, can we understand that these vernacular structures deserve that same level of attention that we very willingly give to the monumental. And I thought about my astonishment after Katrina that Heritage was making the front pages of the newspapers, that the community in the Lower Ninth Ward was making enough noise that you know, people began to sit up and take notice. And you know, here, could there be a more humble structure? And yet, in many ways, this is the symbol of what New Orleans did as a community really trying to raise that rallying cry, not for the monumental, but for the way we live. So I'm going to end with this slide, because I like this slide, but also <laughs> because, you know, what I guess I'm really saying is, for all of our education and all of our training, and the, you know, great fortune many of us have had to travel, maybe what we really need to do is re-engage in that ability to just look carefully and really enjoy that moment of discovery. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lisa, for reminding us to look uh, both broadly and more closely. Thanks. Um, so our next speaker is Grace Jan um, from the Smithsonian, and we'll talk about her experiences um, as a conservator in different environments. Thanks, Grace. Hello. Um, so today my talk will focus on training in Chinese painting conservation in both the East and the West. Chinese painting conservation is a narrow field, but I think it serves as an example for what is going on in other related fields in China. The larger picture of preservation and conservation is greatly impacted by the capacity of a trained conservator to lead others and to apply proper approaches and decisions. Because of this, we should examine what training looks like and some of its more recent developments. I'll share my own personal experiences having studied conservation in both the United States and China, and also now as I continue that training in the context of a Western museum. I'll make some observations and attempt to synthesize my experience. This is an overview of what I will um, present. I'll talk about my background, and I'll make a comparison of education and training in the East and the West focusing specifically on apprentice training in museums and then degree granting programs. I'll um, mention the influence of culture on education and work and then finish up with what I call hybridized apprenticeship um, and that's what we're doing at the Freer Sackler. I also want to make an important side comment that as a second generation Asian American, I look at my environment through a colored lens. I understand parts of Chinese culture and the mindset 
but I'm still a foreigner because my upbringing and initial training in conservation is still from the U.S. I've learned to look at my training in China with a critical eye, but at the same time with a desire to be sensitive to their traditions. For my title, I show that I think of myself as a conservator, a graduate of a conservation program, working in a museum, but in a way I also retain the Chinese traditional mindset of a trainee who is still working with a master. I first became interested in this topic when I saw my grandfather's paintings, which were mounted by a commercial studio in Taiwan, turn yellow within the first um, few years. At the time, I had little knowledge of how a very thin piece of Chinese shred paper or silk was mounted into the format of a scroll, and no idea that these paintings could be damaged by the use of poor quality materials and craftsmanship. Since then, I studied paper conservation at the Conservation Center at NYU, and had the opportunity to work in the Asian Art Conservation Studio at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for my final two years of graduate school. After graduating and with the generous support of the Crest Found Samuel Crest um, Foundation and the Asian Cultural Council, I had the unique opportunity to train at the Shanghai Museum, Beijing Palace Museum, and Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I feel that studying in China is an essential part of the training for conservators in this specialty. This has been the path of all the Chinese painting conservators at the three museums in the United States with mounting studios. Again, I want to emphasize that there are only three museums with specialists. Following in their steps, I specifically selected the Shanghai Museum and the Beijing Palace Museum for my postgraduate fellowship. The four conservators in the United States are Shang Mei Gu at the Freer Sackler Galleries, Smithsonian Institution, Jing Gao at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Yuan Li and Koe Wang, Yuan Li Ho and Koe Wang, um, both at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Yuan Li, Koe, and Jing Gao all received their training at the Beijing Palace Museum and Shang Mei Gu at the Shanghai Museum of Art. The Shanghai Museum was founded in 1952. In 2007, when I was there, there were a total of six conservators. Since, three have retired, and two new students have recently been accepted into the museum. This is a view of the Imperial Palace known as the Forbidden City. The conservation studio at the Beijing Palace Museum was established as well in the 1950s and expanded in the 1980s. There are three painting conservation studios, two original studios and one built a few years ago for the conservation treatment of Zhuan Qinzai, Emperor Qianlong's place of retirement. This project involved the conservation of large-scale wall and ceiling paintings and it was a collaborative effort with the World Monu Monuments Fund in New York. Um, at the time that I was there, uh, I was fortunate to be able to help translating while they're reinstalling the uh, wall and ceiling paintings. In 2008, there were a total of 16 Chinese painting conservators at the Palace Museum. This number included four junior staff. Since then, five conservators have retired. This is just under half of the senior conservators. There does exist the problem of replacing a generation of senior conservators with younger staff without proper training. I also want to point out that mounting and restoration of um, Chinese paintings was a profession that was passed down from generation to generation. It was a family tradition. My teacher, Mrs. Zhang Zuhong, who is the woman circled in red, comes from a family of conservators. Her grandfather, father, brother, who is also circled in red, and son, who most recently came to the Freer Sackler to work with us, all pursued this same career path. Since my study abroad, I have been working at the Freer Sackler for the past four years with Xiang Meigu on Chinese paintings. We work very closely with our Japanese painting conservation team and have had a steady flow of students and professionals from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong coming for short-term exchange. East Asian painting conservation is part of the larger Department of Conservation and Scientific Research where we are able to also work alongside our colleagues in other specialties. So this background is meant to set the stage for my observations and synthesis of training in Chinese painting conservation. I've drawn out this diagram to map what education and training looks like in the East and West. And I wanted to add that in the most recent years, the number of museums, conservation labs, and college level programs has dramatically increased in China um, due to the country's economic development and growing interest in preserving their culture. Keep in mind that this is a period of um, rapid change. 
I added Korea and Japan because there is much overlap among their traditions and history. The style of their paintings in particular are very similar, so training tends to take on the same form. Korea has not until very recently had a large impact on conservation, on Western conservation. So for that reason, I, I won't speak much further about Korea. I extract Hong Kong and Taiwan because these two are very separate from what is going on in China. In terms of educating through a degree granting program, Taiwan adopted this four years earlier than China in 1998, whereas China began its first program in 2002. From this diagram, um, you can see the differences and similarities between the East and the West. And at the bottom corner here, I just pulled out, um, these are, there are centers also for training um, museum staff. And these are, um, they provide short-term workshops for staff at museums that are newly built and do not have a history um, of conservation. But I won't speak very much on those either. In the conservation of East Asian paintings in the West, Japanese conservators were among the first to be working on our museum's collections. The first Asian art conservation studio, oh, sorry, jumping back, let's go backward. Um, I use this diagram to show that from my experience entering the field, our Western understanding of East Asian painting conservation is heavily influenced by Japan and familiar roads point to an apprenticeship. For Chinese painting conservation, there is no clear, solid path for someone pursuing this in the West. Almost all of those who specialize in this field in the US have received training through an apprenticeship. Very few have both a graduate degree from a conservation program and apprenticeship training. The road is very long and daunting for many of those who even toy with the idea of entering the field. In the conservation of East Asian paintings in the West, Japanese conservators were among the first to be working on our museum's collections. The first Asian art conservation studio was established at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in 1907 and headed by a Japanese mounter. In 1923, arrangements were made for Kinoshita Kokichi to split his time between the Freer and the MFA and in, until 1932 when he was offered a full-time permanent position at the Freer. It was not until 1991 that Shang Mei, senior Chinese painting conservator, joined the staff. In 1999, the Freer Sackler receives an endowment to begin the Hirayama program. This program enables a student to begin training in Japanese painting conservation at the Freer Sackler and then transition to an apprenticeship training in a studio in Japan where they are encouraged to stay for as long as possible, preferably for seven to 10 years for complete training. Prior to this, students in the West were told they needed to have someone introduce them or connect them to a studio in Japan. Again, for Chinese paintings, no such program exists. As a graduate of the Conservation Center at NYU, I received a dual degree in art history and art conservation, spending my first two years taking core cur curriculum courses, the third year with independent study courses at local museums, and then completing a fourth year internship at the Met. I took this photo um, of the conservation program website at NYU to illustrate an image of what we commonly associate with Western conservation. Someone looking through a mis microscope, applying details and technical analysis of the painted surface and structure. This is just one iconic image that comes to mind when I think Western conservation. I highlighted in blue text from NYU's website to illustrate a summary of the key elements of our education. I think it includes um, historical, archaeological, curatorial, and scientific studies of the materials and construction of works of art. Students undertake research projects, laboratory work, and seminars. This is from Michelle Mancola, who's in our audience. And um, we learn about the fundamentals of material science, conservation theory, analytical techniques, and preventative care. From my education, I came to understand art conservation to be a cross-disciplinary field. After I graduated and went to China, I chose to be immersed in the art of mounting wanting to further develop my hand skills because this is what I had lacked. I was very conscious of my Western wired brain, and not to say that I ignored, but I really quieted the need to ask many questions and draw impulsive comparisons and conclusions. Although slightly tucked away, in hindsight, I really think that it was my education at NYU that added to and enriched my experience in China. Looking at apprenticeship training, all four senior conservators and other well-known conservators in the field received training at a major museum, notably the Shanghai Museum and Beijing Palace Museum. Training in a museum resembles an apprenticeship, with each student being assigned to one master with whom they would potentially build a lifelong relationship. 
As Zhang Mei, um, who was at the Freer Sackler, recalls her experience at the Shanghai Museum, she tells that they had six students in their entering class, and each pair was assigned to a teacher. For the first five years, she was considered a student and an assistant. In the following five years, she was allowed to be an, begin working on her own projects, but under supervision. And then in her final five years at the museum, she worked independently, but in the same circle with her teacher, who was available to assist if necessary. She worked closely with the master for 15 years before entering, um, before coming to the States and joining the Freer Sackler. So why is apprenticeship training important and why does it take so long to learn? Chinese paintings are complex objects with different formats, styles, materials, and tools. Before you can even begin to re do restorative or conservation work, you must master the technique of mounting paintings, similar to other trade work. You have to learn how to select, cut, color, and line paper and silk. You have to understand the construction of the scroll and album formats, and eventually how to conserve the painted surface and reuse or replace the mounting materials. In my experience, um, mounting alone is not something that can be mastered in two years. While I was in China, I was able to continue my training that I began with Yuan Li at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Some of the first steps of apprenticeship training include learning how to use and prepare tools. Stories that Yuan Li told me came alive when I found myself doing things that she had done as a student at the Beijing Palace Museum. For example, I was able to work with her former colleague and prepare my own brush and soften the bristles on the same concrete outside her former studio. At the Shanghai Museum, every morning I would begin with practice drills, br brushing against a wall for 15 minutes, exercising my wrist movements while holding a bamboo brush, and learning how to fan a towel against the surface of a piece of wet silk. These are all basic techniques used in mounting. I also learned how to mount all the basic formats, hanging scroll, hand scroll, and folding album. But the challenge I felt was remembering all the steps, because some of the steps you might only do once every few months. Apprenticeship training in the context of a museum still continues today. In 2007, Shen Hua, who's the gentleman at bottom um, left, was the youngest member of the six-person team. He already had 10 years of experience training and working at the museum. He was selected to come to the museum after completing his fine arts bachelor degree with no prior experience in mounting or conservation. Chinese tradition gives preference to a student that is young in age, in their late teens and early 20s, and enters as a clean slate. As mentioned before, in the last five years, three conservators have retired. So in China, there's a mandatory retirement age of 55 for women and 60 for men. The challenge these museums face today is training new individuals to the level where they can replace the skill set lost by senior, when the senior conservator leaves. There's a generation gap that museums are just now beginning to address. When Shang Mei began training at the Shanghai Museum, six students entered as a group. At that time, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, there's an intentional push to reestablish the arts and build up a new generation of conservators, some who stayed at the museum and others who went off to work in other places. In the past, many of the older conservators were responsible for training students, but now that role is only given to a select few. What is similar between Shang Mei's experience and today is that training in a museum affords one the luxury of having the security of a permanent position. The student enters as a permanent staff. This enables an apprentice to continue long-term education with a mentor that can easily transition into a lifelong career. As well, in this setting, you have a team of conservators of different levels, particularly many advanced level conservators, all working together. This creates an ideal environment for students because they're able to observe others and the variations in their hand skills, or rather admire the beauty and the uniformity of their abilities. Having studied in China, I found this to be a very different and rewarding experience. In the States, students only have the opportunity to work with one Chinese painting conservator, and only until very recently, two mentors at the Met. There's currently no permanent position for an assistant level conservator, which forces students to find new opportunities when funding runs out, thus breaking the flow of training. Going back to our diagram, I'd like to transition to a more recent development emerging in China that follows a similar model in the West, training Chinese painting conservators through the system of a degree-granting program. Unlike the West, 
students are at the undergraduate level, and immediately upon graduation are offered positions in museums, studios, and auction houses. I want to mention that I did not visit these programs in China, but I've worked with a graduate of the Jilin program, as well as other fellows who are familiar with these programs in China and have shared their experiences with me. Jilin College of the Arts is the first program to offer a bachelor degree in the remounting and conservation of Chinese paintings. It is a four-year program. It began in 2002, and in its first three years, has had a total of 48 students focusing on this specialty. Since, other programs have emerged. By looking at their website, you can find their curriculum, which I listed on the slide. The, west, the website highlights the program's state-of-the-art facilities, scientific equipment, their relationship with professionals in Japan, and also the amount of conferences and attended and research published by the students and faculty. In a way, this program resembles our programs in the West, um, although I think general material science, conservation theory, analytical technique, and preventative care, which we just saw on the, um, the webpage of NYU, appears to be less emphasized. Although I have been told that they do have guest lecturers who are invited to speak on these similar topics. Suzo Art and Design Technology Institute is a vocational college that offers a three-year program in Chinese mounting and repair. Because it is only a technical program and three years versus four years, graduates are unable to find jobs in a museum. I include this school to show um, a different kind of formal training. There are many people out there who have some skills in the mounting and repair of Chinese paintings, but they might not be connected to the museum world or the greater community of conservation. In these degree-granting programs, we will commonly have anywhere from 20 to 30 students and one teacher. This is a far cry from the one to two and, um, student and one teacher ratio found in apprenticeship training. These images show how large a class size can be um, to accommodate all the students. Concern has been that with this student-teacher ratio, it can lead to many students with shallow understanding and not enough personal guidance and hands-on training. The benefits of the development of these programs in China and Taiwan is that more students are exposed to and have access to the fields of art preservation and conservation. This leads to greater awareness of the field across the country. In addition, the students' experiences are brought in beyond Chinese paintings, and they have the option to explore other interests. Many programs invite conservators from abroad, more commonly Europe. This photo clearly shows a student in a beautifully equipped art studio in China working on early Italian painting reproductions. I also recall um, having to help a Jilin student edit a paper she was finishing on Western oil paintings. Students are required to attend lectures, have special projects, and publish research, instead of focusing on um, their hand techniques. The downside to a degree-granting program is that with all these requirements, written work, selection of courses, it can be hard to find time to focus on developing their hand skills. Another notable point is that students in China um, graduate with a bachelor's degree. Students in Taiwan and the US graduate with a graduate level degree. In the US, I think we tend to think of undergrad as a period meant for exploration and general education. It fosters interest, but not necessarily deeper understanding. This is different compared to a graduate program where we gain a level of expertise. Obviously, this is not entirely accurate and I would not go so far as to say that graduate students are more prepared and therefore will be better conservators, but I want to emphasize that pre-program education, which includes art history, studio art, and chemistry, and pre-program experience, internships in museums, is a prerequisite before students begin graduate school. This is different from someone entering directly into an undergraduate program. In general, it's um, important to keep in mind that culture, be it East or West, affects education. I found this fun post on Facebook this week um, that was done by a Chinese-born woman who moved to Germany when she was 14. I don't mean to re reinforce stereotypes, but I do think that there is some truth, and many others have experienced these same challenges when navigating between two cultures. I believe awareness of these differences can help us to better un understand some of the challenges that either a student or someone unfamiliar with the cultural landscape might encounter. For example, I love the picture at the bottom because um, apprenticeship training in the East is much more dependent on relationships. The roles of the student and master run deep in the tradition of Chinese painting conservation. 
In Chinese culture, elders are held with high regard, deserving of respect, and with that, the authority over those who are younger. The young are accustomed to following and not questioning much of what the teacher says. As a Chinese American, I've experienced tension in knowing which way to react or respond, and I found these types of cultural misunderstandings common when working in a foreign environment, not only for myself, but of the interns and fellows from Asia who, who also study in the West. In the East, one's relationship with a teacher is one that you have to be mindful throughout your career. Much of the student's reputation and future is dependent on the teacher's recommendation, for better or worse, depending on the individuals. These infographics depict um, situations that people encounter both in schooling and the workplace. Today, the older generation upholds the traditional preference for apprenticeship training. There is a belief that a degree granting program will not make a graduate <clears throat> a specialist in the field because a student lacks true mentorship and hands-on experience. This is a challenge for students because there is an expectation that they can readily find this type of training. But in fact, it is very difficult for students to enter museums like the Shanghai Museum and the Beijing Palace Museum. And there just aren't enough senior conservators to mentor all the students, especially with the emergence of the degree granting programs. From my experience, I believe that the tradition of apprenticeship training is very important for the development of a conservator. And caution should be taken when following too quickly um, a Western model of educating. It's my hope that the younger generation will reach back in appreciation for the traditions that gave rise to the senior conservators that we respect today. And likewise, that the older generation would consider the challenges facing the young and would try to find ways of combining the education offered through apprenticeship and degree granting training. I do think awareness is there um, and we're moving in the right direction, but to understand that we're still in the beginning stages of finding ways of bridging these two systems. As mentioned previously, there is no training in the US of this sort, formal training. One of the ways we're trying to solve this problem is by securing a permanent position for an assistant Chinese painting conservator at the Freer Sackler. This would be the first position of this type in the States. The Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has offered a $1 million endowment, and we are in the process of raising matching funds. This position um, is what I call a hybridized apprenticeship. This position would enable me to continue training with a senior conservator, um, Shang Mei Gu, as well as apply and develop the skills and knowledge that I learned at graduate school. In this position, I'm able to continue to review basic mounting formats and be in a studio setting where we regularly work with visiting fellows. I help to promote preventative conservation by offering workshops on guidelines for the care and safe handling of East Asian paintings. These workshops are offered to staff at museums with specialists and to students at the conservation and art history graduate programs. Typically, conservators in China are responsible for treatment of the paintings and are less involved with preservation through the means of preventative measures. In the US, conservators are more involved with installation of exhibitions, travel, storage, and so on. In regard to treatment, um, I've learned from Shang Mei that complete remounting is not always the best or safe um, option for the painting. Instead, I've learned to apply minor or remedial treatment techniques. After working for over 20 years in the States, Shang Mei has adopted a more conservative approach to treatment, often adapting her mounting skills to include less invasive treatment options. Uh, treatment techniques. The photo at the bottom shows the Western technique known as friction drying to um, flatten the hand scroll. At the Freer Sackler, I feel that it's uh, truly been a wonderful experience to be in an environment that fosters exchange of both Eastern and Western ideas. So in conclusion, when thinking about universally or globally forged principles of preservation and conservation, I think that conservation training in China shows us that things are still developing and changing. There are two different approaches, apprenticeship and degree granting programs, and different feelings toward which approach is better. What I've just laid out is not, not identical to what we have established in the West, and even more precisely, the United States. This difference understandably results in misunderstanding. I think that by recognizing different cultures and traditions, we can begin to figure out why what is done looks different on the ground. I um, throw up this chart once again to just show how we're moving forward at the Freer Sackler and how 
this hybridized apprenticeship kind of sits in the middle between the East and the West. And that's our effort. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, one of the things we tried to do on the poster was to have the arrow point in both directions so that it's not just uh, uh, a one-way learning process. So I think Grace helped uh, underscore that for us. So our next speaker is Simon, Simon Warwick, who will be talking to us about some of the training and issues at uh, Ankar Wat. Simon, welcome. Well, I'd just uh, like to thank George very much for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be here, and I'd thank Lisa for reminding me that I was invited here because uh, I nearly didn't make it. Um, I was interested by what Joyce was saying because I was actually also came through an apprenticeship in the end. We, I didn't mention it in my bio, but I, I was actually trained as a, as a stone carver uh, before I came a conservator. So uh, there, there are all sorts of ways of uh, in, in the, both the East and the West of coming into conservation. But anyway, I wanted uh, just to give you a quick uh, summary of what I hope to, and to say uh, before I go into it more in depth. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I was very interested to think about all these problems of, of East and West and, uh, and so on and so on. And I decided to go back in to study the history of it a bit before I uh, went any further. So I'll be looking at the, um, how the, the, the European classical approach developed and then how it arrived in the East, which was mainly through uh, various forms of colonialism. And then I will look um, very quickly at what happened in Pagan, in, in Burma, where there was uh, a, a different approach again. And then I'll do a very quick case study of the living heritage conservation that I had uh, done in Angkor, and then perhaps some future scenarios of how we, we can look into the future. So, um, let's start at the beginning. Um, like many things, uh, I'd say that everything started with perhaps the mother of all messy divorces, which was Henry VIII. And um, Henry VIII, uh, well, the, the monasteries were built uh, in the Middle Ages, and the northern monasteries were some of the biggest in, in England. And this one uh, is particularly close to my heart because I actually grew up in one of those houses over there. And this is the Abbey of Revo in North Yorkshire. And uh, this is a wonderful example of, uh, of how uh, the ruin and the, the idea of conservation went into the psyche of, uh, of European um, people who were interested in, in conservation. It was ruined um, during the dissolution of the monasteries in, in, the, in um, 1538, uh, when he took, out, took all the money and so on from the, the monasteries and uh, redistributed it to himself. Um, <laughs> the, uh, come the Industrial Revolution, um, great families uh, around the north of England became extremely rich. And this house, which was uh, it, and is several miles away from the valley uh, with the abbey that I just showed you, was built by what, a man who was known as one of the richest commoners in England called Thomas Duncombe and uh, is a large neoclassical stately home. Uh, it's still lived in by the, the Duncombe family. And as was often the case, they had a, a taste uh, in the 18th century for the neoclassical and they built a lot of these interesting little follies. So they built a nice Ionic temple in the grounds, and when he acquired the, va the next valley, which was Revo, he put into the, uh, into the forest above the valley the most extraordinary piece of landscaping that I've seen in many places. He put another of these two temples, an, an Ionic and a Doric one, at either end of the... Uh, is there a pointer here? Okay. At either, uh, this is one temple and that is the other and he cut this lawn through the top of the hill and this is the abbey here uh, the ruins of the abbey here 
it in meant that you were able to see uh, they also cut through the the forest in these at these points here 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 and this meant that as you walked along your terrace having had tea in the Do ionic uh, temple and some cocktails in the doric one you would get a different view uh, going around 90 degrees of the ruin in the bottom of the valley which would look like this though the ruin the, the view would change as you walked along the the, the, the terrace it's an extraordinary piece of landscaping that was done in the 18th century and uh, really shows the, 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 the appreciation and love of the ruin and the integrated landscape that was uh, apparent even at that early, early stage. It went into art, and there are endless examples of these ruins with a rustic, blissful... Uh, cows and people sitting around having picnics and uh, contemplating the ruins. It's a very common uh, 18th and 19th century image of, of um, the ruin. At the same time, we had the Grand Tour, which uh, Lisa already mentioned. Uh, when the young, uh, the young children of the, uh, these newly rich families would be sent off around Europe to what nowadays people put on backpacks and go and go to Koh Samui for full moon parties. But uh, in those days, they would go and contemplate ruins in uh, ancient cities around Europe. And uh, this, their education, remember, at that time was firmly based in the classics. Uh, at school, uh, if they went to school, which most of them did, they would have spent most of their time studying Latin and Greek and some mathematics, but m uh, mostly it was the classics. So they had a real appreciation and understanding of ancient classical civilizations and art. At the same time, the uh, British were um, having another kind of grand tour in India. And, of course, when they, you set off on a colonial enterprise, you take a lot of luggage, including your cultural luggage, and this, I would like to say here, is where we get a very interesting mixture between uh, what I think we can see as our conservation approach to heritage and some of the politics of colonialism as well. But first, let's just have a look at some of these examples. This is an uh, 18th century um, drawing by Piranesi, uh, Italian, of the, um, of the Villa Adriano in Tivoli. And this, of the same period, is from India, from 20 years later. But you can see the same, the rustic ideal, same cows, same picnics. Uh, of, uh, this was their view of the heritage that they were encountering in the colony. The Greek temple and Hampi in India, the same approach, the same view of this. Now, the thing that, we, that they perhaps didn't notice and that, that I will try and explore is that, yes, they had their classical education. They had been to Egypt, they'd been to Rome and Greece, and they'd seen all these wonderful ruins, but they, all those ruins had been built for gods who were no longer worshipped. They were built for Ra, for Apollo, for Zeus. Uh, the temples here were built for gods who were presently worshipped and continue to be worshipped. This is the temple of Ganesha. In Angkor, the, there was Buddhism, there was Hinduism. These were not dead. This was not dead heritage in the same way as the classical heritage was that they were looking at uh, when they did their grand tour. So perhaps there was an error here that was taken in good faith, perhaps not. But to continue, um, we know that uh, there was this violent discussion between Ruskin and William Morris on the one hand in favour of the conservation of the ruin and uh, uh, Violet Le Duc and uh, George Gilbert Scott who headed the, um, the, the neo-Gothic neo, neo revival movement which in a way was actually thinking more about the restoration and conservation of living heritage than those who we t often think of as the good guys uh, being Ruskin and, and uh, the others. So there's, there's an interesting uh, way to look at things uh, here. Um, 
In India, uh, after the mutiny, uh, it became a full-blown empire. And the Lord Curzon, who was one of the men who consolidated the Archaeological Survey of India, said uh, during his period as Viceroy uh, that the preservation of India's heritage is the fundamental, divinely ordained duty of the colonial government. And um, that, I think, uh, is, an, is an interesting thing to say. But he also... Um, it's interesting because he tended to focus, as did the most of the British India, on the restoration of the Mughal architecture. Now, the Mughal architecture and the Mughals w had invaded India and had imposed a new civilization on India in the same way as the British did. And so, in many ways, by saying this was um, restoring that and, to a large extent, ignoring the indigenous Hindu uh, temples. They were saying these Hindu temples are ruins, part of a decadent, lost civilization. The bright new future is uh, was at one point the invaders of the Mughals who sorted everything out, built the Taj Mahal, etc. And now, of course, us. And so there was quite a political slant on this question of uh, how to look after heritage. Uh, Marshall. Um, set up a conservation manual and he had a, quite a battle with London uh, because he was more in favour of a more sensitive living heritage approach compared with the people sitting in London who were making the rules who were people like from the, uh, the, the SBAB uh, who were saying no you have to conserve the ruin etc and he said what do you know you've never been to India um, I, I'm sitting here and, I, and I've been here 20 years and, and, and I know a bit more than you do uh, eventually, the, he produced this document, which, uh, which helped actually quite a lot. In the meantime, the French, um, though a little later on the scene in the imperial race, um, managed to get hold of Indochina, and uh, with Louis Napoleon and uh, Empress Eugenie's um, pavilion, which went into the, the royal palace in Phnom Penh, they started uh, to arrive in Indochina. And uh, this is the image that we all have of the French explorers hacking their way through the jungle and discovering these lost temples uh, with beards and malaria and native bearers and so on. Uh, it was, couldn't be less true. The, um, the temples had been used ever since the first stone was laid. Uh, and the, there had been foreign visitors to the temples in Angkor from the 16th century onward in the, in, in the shape of Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, and even the Dutch popped over for a short period. So um, the, 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 this, this was a uh, not true image of, the, of uh, Indochina, which today is still enduring. Um, Again, uh, the, the idea of the ruin became very popular. The, you know, this lost ruin in the jungle that was discovered by these, these lucky uh, um, in, uh, invaders. The, this is a uh, contemporary picture, 1909, I think, from the same campaign as, as your photo, uh, which shows that, okay, they were still a little bit overgrown, but they were being used. There was, uh, the monks were in that temple, and they were using it from all the time. And in fact... The, pe the first people to stop it being used as a living site and the people who cut the line between when that temple was built and when it stopped being used were, unfortunately, the heritage authorities. I won't say French, English, whatever. It was, it was us. Um, the, it was, uh, the, these, this was um, the, the, the French documentation campaign and they actually used the temple moat as a runway for their their flights, which took the photograph that you showed. Um, and the, so the, the line uh, of, of use was cut by the people who wanted to, in theory, conserve and restore the temples. Uh, the reason for this is, is that there was a tradition at the time, we're talking about the 20s and 30s, of de-restoration. Of, of this was, um, I don't know how many of you know Rome, but this is the church of Santa Maria in Cosmodin, uh, made famous by Audrey Hepburn in Roman Holiday. Uh, but you might not recognize it because today it looks like this. The reason is that in the 1920s and 30s, it was de 
by Mussolini's architect, Antonio Munoz, uh, who said we need to go back to the authentic fabric, the authentic look, the authentic materials, and show how it was when it was conceived. This was very much the, uh, the philosophy of the time, and it was tended to be the philosophy that was taken in your luggage to the colony. So when the French arrived in Angkor and found this glorious Hindu temple dedicated to Vishnu, entirely filled with Buddhist sculptures, they thought, hold on a minute, this, we don't need all this Buddhist tat. Um, we'll, we'll take it away and put it into a depot, which they did, and here it is. Uh, the reason for all this Buddhist tat in the, um, the temple was that the temples of Angkor, though dedicated to Hindu gods at the beginning, became Buddhist, went back to Hinduism briefly, became Buddhist again, Mahayana Buddhist, and eventually Theravada Buddhist, which they were to the day that the French arrived. And Theravada Buddhism in particular involves a lot of meretricious, meretricious acts of donation uh, and giving money and so on to the temple. Uh, so the temple was full of stuff, and all this was removed so that it could be finally appreciated as the archaeological site that it was. Burma, uh, Myanmar. The, um, this is uh, the, the, the site of Pagan, which, uh, as you can see, 3,000 monuments built by kings and princes, and these were all anonymously funded. They were all built to acquire merit. It wasn't like Angkor, which was a giant city with state temples, with uh, family temples. And so on. This, these were uh, created for, by, by rich people or less rich people kings and princes to acquire merit. And in 1975, there was a huge earthquake and they were very seriously damaged. And a very large um, campaign was launched to do the restoration, which was abruptly halted in 1988 when there was the uprising and Aung San Suu Kyi was imprisoned and all contacts with the international conservation community, etc., etc., stopped. However, um, the, uh, the Burmese authorities continued uh, and the, uh, as the most important archaeologist pointed out by any standard of archaeological architectural excavation and restoration the work done was ignoble uh, it was and I will show you um, the reason was that they launched a huge campaign to raise funds and they used the same technique they said if you want to acquire merit and if you want to facilitate your path towards a good reincarnation, you donate. And they acquired a lot of money by this, but they didn't have any criteria, or they just made up their criteria using pamphlets and books that they had left over. So the result was that they would take a temple like this. Uh, you can see one remaining pinnacle here. And when it was finished, it looked like this. You can see the authentic part here. When they found stupas like this, they finished it up like this. They managed to do 3,000 temples in the space of about five years. Um, I think we can only hope in the next earthquake to, to sort things out. But um, it was based on the whole question of merit, the acquisition of funds, and so on, was an interesting sideline. Now, I'm now going to get into a slightly more technical details of what we actually did on a sculpture in Angkor uh, because this was a situation where we went deeply into the involvement with the local community uh, at pretty much every level and, and I hope that this helps illustrate how I think that the heritage approach of mixing East and West uh, can, be, can be done. Um, I certainly in enjoyed it very much and I got a huge amount of benefit and perhaps merit from it too. Uh, but first let me just give you an idea how big Angkor is because people are always going on about how big and wonderful it is and uh, this is just an example I think you'll probably recognize this we are here if you, uh, using our friend Google Earth put Angkor Wat, just Angkor Wat that's one temple over the top of it it's like that which says something about the size of the place there's another 95 temples surrounding it uh, so it, it is an extremely impressive site, especially when you consider it was built in the 12th century. It is a living temple. It's a living site. 
The local community use it, though, unfortunately, less and less, due not to the, no longer to the Western heritage authorities, but unfortunately to their own heritage authorities who have adopted a similar line, which I think needs to be confronted quite seriously. But the local people are rather excluded from this site. And they, uh, they do occasionally have ceremonies. Here's one in the same gallery that I showed you before. Um, and the monks are present. But I'm going to talk to you about the, the restoration of the sculpture that is here. This is the western entrance to the, to the temple. There, there are the towers of it. And inside is this sculpture, which is known as Tariq. Uh, it is said by the guides to be a Vishnu. It's actually uh, uh, Avalokiteshvara, which means a manifestation of the Buddha. Uh, but it's referred to as everybody as Tariq because he is the venerated king of the ancestors for the animists. So the animists run parallel to Buddhism. They're not in conflict at all, um, and it is universal. From the villages to the highest people, they all respect this question of ancestors and spirits. Now, he, was, uh, he had a problem in the shoulder, uh, and so we were asked to survey it and to, to restore it, to have a look at it. But before we started, we were, it was quite clear that there was a lot of veneration going on. It, it, he was wearing all these clothes, and uh, there was a great deal of donation going on. There were ceremonies carried out every single day, uh, people arriving to give um, gifts, to acquire merit, to get good luck, to good luck in business, weddings, even the lottery, uh, pretty well everything. The, even the foreign community in Long Beach would sometimes send money to their relatives back in Cambodia in order to give donations to this sculpture. Um, so uh, it was, it, it's, very, it's very, very strongly felt by, by the Cambodian people. And as you see, even when we were working on it, uh, they, they were still using this, this sculpture. It, it's the center of, uh, it's the Vatican of animism for them. Uh, we did a lot of research, documentation, study, etc. But for me, some of the most important research we did was actually sitting down in the villages and talking to the community leaders and asking them uh, leading questions. Um, this kind of work is really how you get contact with the people, and you, it takes a very long time. You have to acquire the trust of the, the people. You have to be ready to sit down uh, to eat some strange things and to drink a lot. I think there's a lot to be said for alcohol as a facilitator in cultural heritage comp competition, including Nan's mint tulips. Um, but here it was rice wine, and uh, we asked him, who is the, the, the leader of the, the spiritual community, uh, who is the statue, what does it mean, and how do you feel about us working on it? Is, uh, and he said, well, yes, he's the king of the spirits, he's the king of the ancestors, he brings good luck to the community, etc. And it wouldn't be such a bad thing if you did restore him, because it would bring more strength to him, and that additional strength to him would be of direct benefit to my community. Um, I didn't say in, in the initial photo of the statue, but the head is a copy, it's cement, and the hands were also concrete cement, due to a restoration poorly carried out in the 1982. Uh, we actually had found the original head uh, by Long Story, which was in, in, in the basement of the King's Palace in, in Phnom Penh, and we mentioned that we might be able to get this back. And he said, if you can get that back, that's a big deal because the, all the power is in the head and that will have a big influence on our community. On the other hand, uh, try not to use too many artificial and external materials, if you can. Because, uh, try to use materials that are imbibed with the spirits of the ancestors, so natural materials. And we said, well, we can do that to a certain extent, but not everything. We may need to use some glues, uh, but we will, we'll see what we will do, and, and we'll come back to you on that. And we did. We also planned the intervention to fit in between the religious festivals, the, so the, between the full moons, and we designed a scaffolding that was open at the front so that the people could still continue to have access to the sculpture, even while we were sitting on the scaffolding. And he said, good. Um, now I want to invite you to the ceremony which is happening next week. So we joined them in preparing the decorations for the altars, and they set up this altar in front of the sculpture, which is there. And in this ceremony, which is extraordinary, the, this man is a medium, and he is the only man who can become possessed 
with the spirit of the statue. The, statue, the spirit leaves the, the, the stone and goes into him and becomes an um, interlocutor between the king of the ancestors and the local community. So this lady here is actually saying to him, listen, these foreign people have just arrived and they're going to want to take off your hands and your head. Um, how do you feel? And he began to cry, uh, real tears. And, and then she said, no, but it's okay, it's okay. They think they've found the actual head and they're going to put back stone arms. And he said, good, and became very happy and started to dance. And this was actually more than we'd expected. We, were, we knew we were consulting the local community, but we hadn't expected to actually consult the king of the ancestors, but uh, we were very pleased to be able to do that. So we made our decisions, uh, but really side by side with that guy, as well as, as well as the technicians. And the decisions were to replace the cement arms with, other, with carved sandstone, to consolidate as far as possible with natural materials, and to consider the return of the original head. The lacquer, and we, we talked about lacquer earlier this morning, it was extremely important because we were shown this inscription uh, which uh, says basically the queen mother in the 16th century was so proud of her son who had restored the temple that she decided to have her hair cut and burnt and mixed with the lacquer which would then be used to restore all the statues in the, um, in the, the temple. So we knew the date more or less of the application of the lacquer. And we found that the lacquer is actually over joints and cracks in the sculpture, which means that that statue was restored before the application of the lacquer. So we're looking at a restoration, uh, which is pre-1600, uh, thus also giving the lie to the fact that the only people who ever do any restoration or conservation are the people who arrive with the beards and the shotguns. Uh, the arms were badly damaged and were cracking, and there was these pins which were coated with lead, but unfortunately the lead didn't cover that part. It rusted, cracked, and so the, uh, the forearms to the north were falling off and needed to be worked on. We took out all the pins, and you can see here the very sophisticated shapes of pins uh, made by the 16th century restorers uh, and coated with lead, and they would have been fine if they hadn't just had one bubble, and the bubble at the top of here meant that there was access of air and humidity to the iron and, and it expanded and broke. Uh, we did the cleaning of the lacquer and found that it was red and gilded. That's dirty, that's clean, so there was an extraordinary difference. Um, and we also consolidated the lacquer using the resin from the trees which uh, Mr. Schweitzer mentioned before. And uh, this is also, it is from the poison ivy tree. It's, it's very nasty stuff to work with, actually. You come out in spots and boils if you've worked for more than 20 minutes. Uh, but we managed to use it, and you can see here we're using it in a conservation way. So we didn't remake all the lacquer on the surfaces. We used the lacquer to fix what the original lacquer. So we're, this is a, a kind of mixture of east and west again. We're using authentic materials, but we're using them in a perhaps more eastern way. We took apart all the fragments that we could to take out the iron. And we made a new pin from stainless steel. So this was where the, the material stopped being uh, imbibed with the spirit of the ancestors, unfortunately. And we put it in uh, using the original holes. One new hole there, but the others were all the original holes. And we reassembled it. Uh, we glued it together, again with uh, non-authentic glue, but only in one place. And we made the new hands. The new hands was a problem because we did not know what he should have been holding. Uh, it's impossible to actually find out. So we made a neutral object, uh, a nondescript uh, object for him to be holding, uh, which we did in collaboration with the people from the village who thought that was the best solution as well. So we, we, we didn't take any decisions without actually discussing them with, with the people in the village. Uh, we then trimmed them in, and we had to make them fit exactly the broken part, which is very difficult because you have to carve the stone to be the exact opposite of the break. Normally, you would do a smooth cut, stick them together, and that would be easy enough. But here, we had to actually sculpt the opposite of the breakage, and that was because we didn't want to cut 
the original stone because it was so precious to the community. And so down here, again, it was extremely difficult. You see, we had to actually cut both sides of a piece of stone in order to put back the hand. It was a complicated operation. And we finally got permission to bring the head back. And they said to us, OK, the head's coming back, but we're not going to tell you when because it's so valuable that uh, it will be a security risk. So they had to bring it from Phnom Penh by road. And they said, we'll only tell you the night before. So get ready, and when, 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 you, when it, it arrives, we'll tell you. So at 10 o'clock at night, we got a call. And they said, it's ready. Uh, you'll be there at 5.30 tomorrow morning. So we got up at 5.30 in the morning. We got into the trucks. We set off to the temple. We came around the corner, and we found about 200 people sitting in front of the temple uh, with a full orchestra, uh, tables, altars, there were no secrets at all, as uh, is always there. Uh, one man in the depot had seen it. He'd called his friend, who'd called his friend, and they'd worked all night to prepare this. It's coming around the corner in the truck with the leaders of the Heritage Authority, their faces were a picture, and they all started accusing each other of telling people. Um, in fact, it was purely a, a jungle telegraph that uh, spread the word. And at that point, we handed the head over to them. This, at this point, it belonged to them. This was, they'd created this heritage. This was their uh, veneration. And so we, we put it in front of their altars that they'd built. And we said, when you've finished, tell us. Try not to take more than two hours. But uh, when you've finished, tell us. And they had a full ceremony, by which time uh, hundreds of people were turning up. Uh, and it became more and more and more. Um, they, they even ran out of these little strings which they had to give to everybody. They anointed everybody with perfume. It was an extraordinary moment and perhaps the only time in my career when people have actually come up and given you a hug because they were so happy that you'd done some work, which is not, I think any of you who are conservatives know that's usually the opposite is the case. Um, they then tried to all join us in returning the head and we, we had to put a stop to that eventually. You can see here, by that time, the TV had turned up, and there were more and more people coming down the causeway. Uh, it was really an event. Uh, we put it back, and there it is. Um, and we also went back to visit the, the, the people in the village to see, later to see what kind of impact it had had. And he said, very good. The, the young people are much more interested now than they were before. Um, partly because it's been restored, partly for the wrong reasons. They saw lots of foreigners on TV there, and now they want to know why, so they come and ask me, and that gives me a chance to discuss with them. So here it is just after the restoration, before we... Um, it, uh, the same day, I think, and they were already using it for weddings. Um, and it is an integral part. There isn't a couple in, in Angkor that doesn't have their photo taken yeah, in front of this. And the, uh, what is interesting for me, and this is where I think we have a possibility for the future, um, in that picture he was virtually naked. Within a week it was covered with glorious clothes, a new umbrella, new altars, uh, it just, all this stuff arrived. And this here, for those of you who can't read Khmer, says His Excellency Ministry of Commerce Chom Piset and his lady wife Tem Tep Bota. They spent at least $1,000 in preparing raiment for, for the sculpture, which they donated, and they put their name on it. This is an ancient tradition that goes back to, if you think of Pagan that I said before, even today when you go to a pagoda, if you make a donation, uh, I, had to, I went to have a ceremony for my mother recently, and I gave them $20, and they wrote my name down, and that's going on the wall in a list of people who've donated. It's all part of the acquisition of merit. When we finished this, people came up to me and said, why didn't you tell us that you were going to do this job? We'd have paid for it. Now, here is an interesting solution for the future, uh, not just involving businesses, but involving, involving people on every level through the, this question of the Buddhist acquisition of merit. I think it's an interesting thought for the future. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude. Um, I think we can discuss.
So some of you may have noted that the subtitle of the conference was Engagements, Exchanges, and Entanglements. I think uh, Simon just uh, gave us examples of all three of those. Um, he also reminded me of uh, a time when I uh, went into a pub with John Larson in London. He, was, he at the time was a conservator at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And we were sitting at the pub and he takes a, a very serious uh, um, a disposition and he looks at us and says, what's the most important solvent in conservation? And we all said, acetone, acetone. He lifts up his beer, he said, no, ethanol. <laughs> <laughs> so for our final speaker, um, I welcome Jack Wade to the podium. Um, Jack, you'll finish us up for the day. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, I'm pleased to talk about Yin Yu Tang today at the Fitch Symposium because I think it's one of the last projects Jim Fitch worked on before uh, he died in uh, 2000. What I'm going to talk about is moving an 18th century house from China to Salem, Massachusetts. It was truly a case of traditional Chinese architecture and construction meeting modern American uh, preservation technology. Uh, it included many involved and complex relationships uh, between American and uh, Chinese. And this morning we heard uh, a lot of threads uh, emerge in the various talks. Uh, what we'll see now is how in this one project, a solution was developed to weave those threads together into a uh, coherent whole. It's really a case of uh, East meets West, and it's a uh, very small scale. It's really where the rubber meets the road. The question is, why Salem, Massachusetts? Uh, the answer is Salem in the 1780s through the early 19th, century was the center of the China trade in the United States. And as early as the 1790s, a museum was established in Salem to uh, house artifacts, uh, works of art that were brought back from China. That museum is involved uh, into the Peabody Essex Museum, uh, which is a combination of the Peabody Museum and the Essex Institute. The uh, Essex Institute uh, was an early 20th century organization to preserve um, American ship captains and merchants house from the uh, golden age of the uh, China trade. The idea was to bring as part of the uh, Peabody Essex Museum's major expansion a Chinese merchants house uh, to Salem that would be contemporary with the China trade and the American houses that it uh, already owned. When George called me about this, he, we talked about it and we said that this would be a uh, project that Fitch would really like, and uh, he did. The way he was involved was, uh, we talked this morning about international charters. Um, what was, there's a lot of constituents in this project. There was a donor that had its own architectural and uh, curatorial staff. There's a museum with an extensive curatorial staff. There are architects who had their own ideas as they always do. And um, there needed to be some rational way of making decisions about what was going to happen uh, with the house. So a series of guidelines were drafted for its documentation and then its treatment. And to help um, the team, the design team, which included the donor and the uh, museum, in drafting these guidelines, a uh, team of uh, preservation experts was assembled and uh, included Fitch, who emerged as the leader. And I think um, the only member of that team that's here today is Michael Lynch, who was with SPNAA, now Historic New England at the time. 
George also asked to talk about problems and uh, challenges. Um, we had a lot of challenges and some major problems, not the least of which was that um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts decided that this was not an historic building, that it was a new building um, comprised of old building parts, which meant that it had to meet all the code requirements of a new building and none of the historic preservation uh, provisions apply. So there are no uh, uh, concessions made because the building was historic. Um, as we go through this, we'll uh, look at some of the other challenges. Uh, previously, that was uh, a 19th century view of the house. This is the house um, in the early 20th century. It's very typical of the architecture of that region with uh, severe exterior walls, uh, small windows, but inside there's a courtyard and there is uh, quite elaborate decoration. Um, this morning in Vince Michael's talk, we saw a, a uh, photograph of a restored banking office. This uh, house was built for a family of bankers. They actually came to the village somewhere around 1210 AD and became salt merchants, which in China uh, was the uh, predecessors of the banking system. They became pawnbrokers and then bankers. And what they would do would be to go all over China and have offices, and then they would send the money back to the ancestral village, which was Huang Kun, this uh, where uh, Yinyu Town was located. And uh, they would visit annually the village and uh, uh, add accoutrements to the uh, house. This is where it's located in Anhui province. Uh, it's uh, southwest of um, Shanghai. Very poor region. It uh, was pretty much closed to outside tourists until after the Cultural Revolution. Tourists now uh, are mostly Japanese tourists who come to see the Yellow Mountains, although there uh, is a real attempt to develop a cultural tourism here. The village before the building was dismantled was accessible only by footpath and a road was constructed uh, by the museum uh, in order to get the building out. This is what the village looks like today. Uh, these houses are 19th century houses but they use the traditional materials um, spatial organization, so there's a great deal of architectural uh, cohesion to the village. And these are uh, materials which actually are the same materials that were used in Yinyu Tang 200 years ago. On the um, left we have roofing tile, on the right are um, small wood timbers. This is the quarry, actually the quarry where the stone came from. Uh, it's an OSHA inspector's nightmare. What they do is they uh, quarry the stone at the top and it uh, comes down uh, where it's uh, picked up and then taken and, and carved. On the left is making uh, roofing tile and this is not a museum situation or uh, uh, this man's making tile that's actually going to be used in repairing uh, the houses of the village. We talked about tradition, construction tradition today and process. Uh, this building wasn't considered a monument. It was a vernacular house that was very typical of the region and the uh, tradition is not to tear it down when it started to wear out and rebuild it in, in kind. It was to repair it and uh, keep it going, to do it as economically as possible. On the uh, right is a photograph of a carpenter uh, making repair items for uh, contemporary houses. 
what happened was that once the Cultural Revolution was over and money started to come into China, people would come into these villages and uh, buy up old houses and take them down and build new buildings, which were, they thought, based on Western ranch houses, flat roofs, uh, completely different spatial organizations, and uh, they're very proud of that. Uh, most of the time they came in from outside the village uh, in question. Yin Yutang uh, was sold by the family. They haven't lived there since before 1980. They had moved to Shanghai. And the building was going to uh, be demolished. The contract had already been signed. When the museum, uh, having scoured this whole region of China looking for an appropriate house to bring to Salem, located it, they were able to get the house, all the contents, furniture, and 500 years of business papers, all of which uh, went to Salem. The house was dismantled by the uh, uh, workers from the Ministry of uh, Cultural Relics. They did an excellent job taking it apart. Uh, it came to Salem in 200, in 20, excuse me, uh, 20 shipping containers. And here it is, the route it took. And what to do with all of this? Well, the first thing that had to be done was it had to be disinfected, and for good reason. Um, the next thing was uh, the donor provided a warehouse of 100,000 square feet in Melrose, Massachusetts, to lay out and conserve uh, the various parts of the building. And that took uh, three years to do that. And what it was, uh, because the warehouse was so large, what was done, uh, it was laid out in components, almost like uh, an air, after an airplane crash in a hangar. The foundation was over here. The um, roof was here. The various rooms were uh, laid out. We were able to determine, after a lot of work, uh, what pieces were missing, uh, what pieces were misnumbered, but all of it was sorted out. The decision was to put it into a courtyard at the Peabody Essex Museum. And this morning we saw examples of um, buildings were built over historic uh, structures to protect them. That would have been a good solution here because it would have saved us a lot of trouble. The donor in the museum, however, wanted this building to be experienced the way it was in China, even to the point of having uh, irregular walls and spaces to find the buildings like it was in the village. It's a little bit difficult uh, because the climate in China was similar to Georgia or northern Florida, and here you're putting it, the building in, uh, a New England seaport winter situation, which uh, was not conducive to longevity. Also, they wanted to use nothing but traditional materials. Now, one of the things that came out of the guidelines was the uh, documentation requirements. Uh, there were over 250 uh, measured drawings done of the building, ranging from uh, exonometrics like this to details of all the um, framing uh, joints, which were considerable. Very elaborate joints because it was a symbol of wealth to have a more complex uh, uh, mortise and tendon joint. What this did, though, was make it very difficult for the building officials to uh, approve the building because these joints made the structure indeterminate, and they had, the building officials had no loading charts for 18th century uh, cryptomeria joists. Um, that was a problem. In the uh, warehouse, these are the foundation stones. They're all taken out, laid out dry. 
We started out with the construction manager who was doing the uh, new building for the Peabody Essex. They um, did not have preservation experience and um, very soon after beginning the foundation process, uh, they declined um, and uh, actually the people who were working in the warehouse went off to do Barnes and Noble's college bookstores. These are the uh, drawings that were done. Each stone which was numbered in China it's shown where patches have to be made, where uh, Dutchman had to be installed. There's a complete record of what is original in the building and what's a replacement part. A lot of stones had to be fabricated, especially the bottom of the foundation stone, which we'll see later. This was done by uh, Chinese workers, some from the uh, Ministry of uh, Cultural Relics, some were local uh, uh, workers from uh, the village. And one of the things the donor really wanted was significant Chinese worker participation. So uh, what we wound up on the job with was uh, Chinese craftsmen, American restoration craftspeople, and traditional uh, union uh, workers. One of the reasons the uh, previous construction manager uh, declined the job was that they're worried about union uh, involvement and uh, opposition to using Chinese craftsmen. What had to happen was that we actually uh, formed a uh, construction management company and held the contracts so that we had a very close uh, coordination between architects and, and, and the workers. And what the union required was that for every one Chinese worker, and we had to have brick masons, stone masons, carpenters, tilers. Uh, for every one Chinese worker, we had to have two Boston local union people on the job. For every uh, three uh, American uh, workers, restoration crafts people, we had to have uh, four union workers. So we had a lot of union people um, watching the process of, of restoration. <laughs> and here are some of the Chinese workers using um, techniques that were very similar to what was used in uh, the original construction. And the good thing about this was that it allowed the uh, systematic documentation of the construction process. Um, here are people from our office taking the various rooms and putting them together to, to see uh, how they went together and where we had all the parts. This is an American uh, restoration carpenter showing the kind of patching that was uh, done for partitions. These are the carpenters and what they're doing is uh, making new posts and uh, beams for the building and they were extremely fast. What they could do is take a tree and square it up in no time. This is not like what you see at Williamsburg or Old Sturbridge Village where they very carefully go. I mean they just this is how they did it. They, they, they built new houses this way, and then they would take the square beam and then make it round again. In patching the um, various wood members, we used a, a variety of Chinese and uh, American techniques. And there's no problem although we had worn, been warned that there were likely to be problems between the Chinese craftsmen and the American uh, uh, restoration people, there was no problem at all. They developed a very strong respect for each other and uh, uh, the relationship was extremely good. So th this actually becomes part of the exhibit of how they uh, repaired buildings in China and uh, what you can do now using 
newer technology to repair it. This shows uh, how beams were uh, scarped together. It's hard, it was difficult to get new wood for um, the building because uh, a lot of the species were not readily available. So what uh, happened was the testing was done and, and American uh, species were selected. And this was a dry run at the warehouse of the frame put back. Uh, this was done for two reasons. One was to see uh, how it would go together. The second was, and most importantly for the building uh, inspectors because there's no way they could react to the capacity of the frame so what we had to do was have it assembled like this and then load test it to demonstrate that a building with very small members could be extremely strong and uh, it turns out that it indeed was. I think it, yeah. This is how it uh, was moved to the Peabody Essex, and you can see the uh, spaces around the building, uh, which were reminiscent of the uh, uh, spaces around the building in China. And this is uh, the frame and the building being constructed. And this is a traditional Chinese uh, ceremony to put the ridge beam in place. We knew we were going to have trouble with the materials and their longevity. And one thing we found out was that we had no uh, stone at the base of the wall. And that's because the stone, the brownstone was very um, porous and it didn't perform well in China. They just didn't bring those over because they're too uh, disintegrated. But we had to use the same brownstone from the village. So what we did was to put in a uh, stainless steel uh, plate to hold the stone, put in the new brownstone, new sandstone from the village, which was sacrificial, so that in 20 years, if that has to be replaced, and it's, we know it's going to fail, uh, it's just taken out and a new piece put in, and uh, the museum got a number of new pieces uh, from the quarry, so it's well stocked. The same thing with the roof tile. The roof tiles were just put in place uh, over flat tile, not fastened at all, and of course this nowhere uh, near meets the uh, building code. So uh, what was done was that a plywood uh, substrate was put down over the flat tile. What that did was to provide a uh, shear membrane to resist seismic stresses. Seismic uh, uh, code requirements were a huge problem here. And then uh, the roof consisted of concave and then convex tile. New high performance uh, concave tiles were done and then the traditional uh, convex tiles were put over the place but fastened down with the idea that each year uh, some of those convex tiles are going to have to be replaced. And we had uh, a Chinese tiler working with the uh, American uh, roofers to do it. This is it, the tile going in place. Let me go back. And this is what it looks like today. The building had an open courtyard. It was called the Sky Well. And the donor and the museum were very insistent that that be open to the weather, but it be closed off in winter. So what was done was a skylight system was designed. Each uh, fall, the skylights are put over the sky well. Each spring, a crane comes in and takes them off. 
So this is what it looks like most of the time when visitors are there. Now seismic was the real problem because the walls consisted of, uh, it's, it's a wood frame building with a uh, curtain wall of brick that's two wides thick. The floors are single planks so that the ceiling on one floor is the floor board for another. So what do you do to make that conform to the current uh, seismic code? And also the building had to have a mechanical system, uh, heat and ventilation that met code. What was done was uh, the heating ducts and the conduits were put in in stainless steel, so it becomes a frame. That becomes the seismic reinforcing. There's no separate structure other than uh, the stainless steel. This is what it looks like. It, the uh, vertical elements were chopped into the uh, brick walls. This is some of the equipment that was required. It wasn't air conditioned. The curators determined that the uh, uh, building did not have to be air conditioned. Fitch would have been very pleased with this because the building responded to its uh, environment uh, extremely well. But this is just the heating and ventilation plant which is underneath the building. Uh, accessibility was a huge problem as well. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the gong tower that was behind the building. It was taken down in 1980, actually collapsed, and it was put back. Uh, it had the kitchens there, so it was put back with the kitchen. This is some of the field work that was going on, looking at other uh, kitchens in the village. We were able to find the uh, the uh, footprint of the kitchen and the oven so that that could be restored pretty accurately. But the gong tower also housed a new elevator, which is here, and a fire stair that was conforming. In addition, the house had to be fully sprinklered, and that was uh, easier to conceal. That wasn't so much of a problem. The curators insisted that the building, which had raised sills so that you had to step up and over the sill to get into the various rooms. They thought that that was a really important character defining feature. The um, Massachusetts uh, Architectural Access Board didn't agree that that was, uh, sh should take precedent. So what was done was that um, the sills, which are sandstone, were put on hydraulic jacks so that they rise, they go up and down, and it's the only way that the uh, curators and the uh, building officials could both have their way. And this is at the end of the job, uh, Chinese workers, and uh, this is actually the uh, union shop steward for the Masons Union. And this is what the building looks like today. This is the uh, sky well, the courtyard. These are goldfish bowls, which, uh, ponds, which uh, they actually stored rainwater in. Decorative wooden um, uh, screens, which we saw this morning, uh, very, work very well from a climatic standpoint. And again, these are all furnishings that were in the house. One of the things that, one of the arguments that the guidelines helped uh, settle was that initially the museum administration wanted this all restored to the nines like it's American houses. And uh, using the guidelines and going through a long process, uh, it was decided to present the rooms the way they were in China, so that you have one room that was pretty much in its original late 18th century state. You had another room with uh, uh, wallpaper from the 19th century. You had another room that had posters from uh, the Cultural Revolution. And that gives a much richer uh, 
uh, presentation to the public. These are some of the bedrooms. Again, all these, everything you see here was in the house. The wallpaper had been conserved and treated. Uh, there's electricity was introduced in the 1920s and the uh, fixtures, if you can call them that, were replicated and that's what lights the house today. The house was part of a, a very uh, extensive educational program. These are uh, publications on the house. This is a very complete history of the building. This is a book that a booklet that we did on the restoration. This is a uh, DVD. And in addition to that, there's a very extensive website. Part of the uh, program, the cultural and educational program, um, has been taking people from China, including politicians, um, to Salem. There's a whole, there are two galleries uh, in the new building that explain the, uh, the house and what it means culturally. Uh, they have a program where they take school children from suburban Boston, bring them to China, and bring China uh, school uh, children over. One of the effects of this has been that they brought politicians from China. And at first, they didn't quite understand why these Americans were making all the process about a house like this, which uh, they had many examples of and which were being torn down. The governor of the province came over and uh, said that uh, when he returned, no more houses of this period would be torn down, could be torn down without his specific permission. And um, I think the best thing was that he, he decreed that the new house, which was a real uh, intrusion into the village, was to be torn down and was to be replaced by a replica of uh, Inu Town. These are some of the uh, activities. These are American and Chinese students in the courtyard. This is an American uh, student's uh, interpretation of the house and uh, a drawing of what she uh, thinks the house looked like. The family was very involved in all this, as was uh, the entire village. And um, they, even though they had moved to uh, Shanghai, felt very badly that they were abandoning their ancestral house and that it was going to be uh, uh, replaced. And so they're very pleased to, uh, that this uh, solution was arrived at. And they've been back uh, a number of times to Salem. And this is what it looks like today with the restored gong tower and kitchen. Thank you. Can we call the, uh, the speakers up to the table? We'll finish up with a few, few questions. Originally, Tony Wood was going to be your moderator, so I'm going to pinch hit for Tony. Typically, with a pinch hitter, the hitter that coming, coming in is better than the person who was supposed to bat, but this is not the case. Tony is a, a, a terrific moderator, and I'm probably not quite up to that level. Come on, sit down, please. So, I was also taking in Christina Pugliese's suggestion about um, kind of renaming our profession, and I was just wondering what the dean would say if we changed the uh, letters for the school to GSAPCMBE, Curatorial Manager for the Built Environment. I'm not sure all those letters will fit on the front there, but um, we'll keep that in mind. So, uh, questions from the, from the audience. We're starting to thin out a little bit. It's been a long day. Um, comments? Yes. Uh, this is for Simon and Lisa. Um, Debbie Mathis is just one of, uh, Debbie Mathis is one of 
number of NGOs working at Angkor, including um, Indian and Japanese, I think, NGOs and perhaps other Asian ones. I wonder if both of you could comment on um, the other NGOs' approaches to both fabric and ritual and people, and specifically the Asian ones, if you're familiar with them. Well, I think, um, I think one know, of the criticisms or this morning was we need to move a little closer oh, to the okay, microphones. Sure. Thanks. Um, you know, I think that, first of all, there, there's at the height of activities at Angkor, and Simon can probably can correct me, but there were probably close to 40 international teams working at Angkor, um, all, uh, of, I don't know, at least 15 European countries had teams at various points. Um, there were indeed Chinese, Korean, uh, Japanese teams uh, working on site. Um, the model that came to be at Angkor was countries adopted individual te temples, um, financed mostly through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of those individual countries. And so there was a kind of isolationism in a way because each team was very autonomous. The UNESCO ICC format meant that twice a year people came together and talked about what they did. Um, you know, I think that everybody had a vast majority of the teams composed of Cambodian workers. So, you know, certainly the Cambodian point of view was strong in the workforce, um, but I think every country approached it in slightly different ways. So, and I don't know that the Asian groups approached it any, in any distinct way, except taste really drives a lot of this. So some countries right now have more tolerance for reconstruction and other countries have less. And so what you do see, I think, at the ICC forum is you, know, you, you see the range of possible approaches in the field all laid out sort of country by country. You know, Simon, uh, if you want to add comments. <laughs> yeah, it depends how controversial we want to be. Um, the, yes, the, 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 the ASI has been present uh, at Angkor for quite a long time. They were there in the 80s, and then they came back uh, recently to work on the Temple of Ta Prom, which is an extremely difficult temple because it's the one with the forest, known by the Lonely Planet as the Tomb Raider Temple. Um, and the problem there is, is how to manage the natural heritage and the cultural heritage at the same time. Um, they're doing their best. They, they've, they have developed a, a better approach than perhaps they had at the beginning, but they did come from a, quite a traditional standpoint. They, uh, they're direct um, heirs to the, 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 the heritage tradition that I outlined in my, uh, in my piece. Uh, the Chinese, too, um, initially they were, they were quite heavy on reconstruction, though they've now on their second temple, and they have changed their approach quite a lot. Um, I think one thing that should be stated since I've been quickly looking around, and I don't think there's anybody here who's going to be present at that meeting, uh, apart from you. But, um, India and China, of course, are the biggest uh, players in politically and economically in, in that part of the world. And when they sign a bilateral agreement with a small country like Cambodia, they pretty much do what they want. And they do it directly with the Prime Minister. So there is quite a difference between that and uh, coming in as a small or even an independent uh, um, uh, an NGO uh, because the, the way that you're treated by the, the, the authorities is significantly different and that unfortunately plays quite a big role um, in, in what, what gets approved and what doesn't. But I didn't say that. I mean, I think one thing to add to the experience at Angkor is in addition to the financial commitment that these countries made and the technical expertise that was a part of it, you know, some groups really took a very broad view of what their engagement was. So the Japanese team and Sophia University, for instance, I mean, really went a step beyond simply on-site activities. I mean, they've taken several dozen people to Japan to get advanced degrees in engineering and architecture. And so, I mean, I think that 
only time will tell, but I mean, I think certainly the Japanese investment has been very much in um, truly trying to offer something to the Cambodian team so that they can really be the people in the next generation um, tackling these problems um, without quite so much uh, European and other Asian influence. Yeah, I certainly think the Japanese are, uh, have made a major contribution there. I mean, apart from the huge uh, involvement in logistics and, and funds, uh, they did do the most training, I would say. Uh, there is actually, it's part of the contract you sign with, with the Cambodian government that a percentage of your budget has to go to training. Um, but some people take that more seriously than others. And the Japanese have really taken that on board and, and, and done it properly. Uh, and it's also very interesting, their approach, because they have really... They really sat down and examined all the previous approaches and kind of looked at it all, uh, studied it all, and then tried to do it better, which is what, is what they do best. I mean, look at the Japanese cars are a good example of that. Uh, and they really have done a superb job. Um, the Koreans, incidentally, are coming soon. Um, you mentioned the, the Koreans as, as uh, not having done much. Uh, in, they, they're just about to arrive, and they actually sent out, and maybe they sent to you too, they, um, mm. they asked for all the people who've been working in Angkor to prepare uh, a study, uh, an analysis of what they've done, and, 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 and send it to them so that they could review what, what's been done previously, which was an interesting approach, and we'll see what happens. Uh, my advice for them was to do as little as possible, because they've chosen a temple which hasn't been touched since 1919 and is in relatively good condition and doesn't seem to be moving. So, so I was desperately trying to, to, to tell them to do uh, as little as possible. Yes, yeah. Well, I, uh, sort of to come on to the uh, conservation training aspect uh, from Anchor to Jack Waits project, um, you talked about this very interesting thing where you had the union stewards, the American craftsmen, the Chinese craftsmen, and presumably they worked together a long time what did those people go on to do afterwards? And I'm just wondering how that sort of unusual East meets West craftsperson experience might have uh, might have borne fruit later. Well, the <clears throat> the Chinese uh, craftspeople went back to China and uh, presumably are um, still with the Ministry of uh, Cultural Relics. The American Restoration um, people um, approach this not as a, a Chinese experience. They approached it like the whole project was approached, that it uh, should be done in a very uh, uh, methodical, professionally uh, competent way and they going on to do uh, a number of significant projects in this country. The union people were kept at arm's length and they did things like um, uh, the mechanical systems and it didn't matter to them that it was in this building or a public school or housing project. So they've gone on on their own way. Yeah, somehow I don't imagine the Chinese workers going back and starting a union. <laughs> uh, other questions or comments? Yes. A question for Simon. Um, when you restored this uh, Avaluki Teshwara uh, statue, I think it's absolutely right not to touch the lacquer. Were there suggestions from the locals to restore the original lacquering and gilding? Funnily enough, no, they didn't uh, say to... to uh, we were very lucky, uh, I have to say, uh, because uh, we found ourselves in agreement uh, right across the board with the, with the people. We didn't, we didn't tell them to say that, um, but I think the difficulty comes when you don't agree, of course. Uh, we, we, we were in, in broad agreement. Uh, you know, we said that was what we were thinking of doing, and they said yes. But they never said uh, re it, no. Um, I noticed that after it was restored, some people started to stick gold to it again, uh, because it is tradition that you take a little piece of gold leaf and stick it on a sculpture. You see that often in Thailand. Um, they were doing that for as long as it was clean. Uh, it became dirty quite quickly, and they stopped after it got dirty, so uh, it, it seems to be 
link, linked with that. Um, Michael. Uh, this is a question for Jack. Um, we saw a couple of buildings that were either relocated or reconstructed within about 200 feet of their original site. Your building got moved to another cultural zone, uh, climate zone. How did it, how has it held up after the last 10 or 12 years? <clears throat> well, they knew that it was going to have, uh, it was going to have to require maintenance because it did in China. So one of the things that happened was that we had a contract, have a contract to go back uh, periodically to look at the building. It has held up much better than the museum expected. But um, each year, a few of the tile have to be replaced. Um, some of the uh, lime plaster has to be replaced. But uh, it's actually held up better than the new building, the new museum building, which is being, <laughs> being reconstructed. Mm. And I, I think that's because. Uh, well, you're not getting sued for <laughs> Um, in fact, they're rebuilding the, the part of the new building that's right near UU Town. Yeah, they're surprised that it held up so well. But it does require, any building requires maintenance and they're prepared for it. They bought a lot of extra tile, uh, a lot of extra stone, a lot of extra brick. So far they haven't used much of them. <laughs> yeah, like those sills going up and down. <laughs> uh, the easy answer is I don't know. Um, um, it's hard to say what the budget was because there are a lot of extra things included, like um, I don't know what they paid for the building and its contents in China, but part of the deal was that they restored uh, an ancestral hall, which uh, uh, we looked over in the village. Um, there's a warehouse that was uh, not paying any rent for three years. Next to it was an apartment complex where we alone had four apartments. The Chinese workers had apartments, and the uh, American Restoration craftspeople that came in from outside the Boston area had apartments. The educational program, I, d I, I don't know what that cost. That, that was an integral part of the uh, construction process, though. <laughs> What's that? How did you set your fee? Yeah. How you set our fee? Um, it was uh, a combination of ways. Uh, we did an historic structure report, which was uh, and a maintenance plan and special studies. They were all done for lump sum fees. Where um, work was bid out, like the mechanical work, uh, the structural work, we were paid a percentage fee on that. And then um, the rest of it was basically cost plus. Jorge. Yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, congratulate the speakers because they were four fantastic presentations. And each is, could be the subject for hours of, of discussion, maybe through some ethanol. I don't know if you're providing that later. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I wanted to ask a bit of a general question uh, sort of at, 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 the t at the table. Uh, I, I was really um, uh, delighted to hear Simon's uh, brief discussion of, of the field um, in, in the expanded frame of colonialism. Uh, and also the way in which we come with expectations to all the sites that come from our education. And in a way, we come to these sites to confirm the lessons we've already learned. So very little is actually learned on site. Uh, in the Grand Tour, there were conf confirming lessons about the, the importance of the classical world. And as Lisa mentioned today, tourists visit sites today to confirm 
uh, a lot of the uh, images that they've seen already of these, uh, of these places. So they're told they have to go to see the sunrise at a certain place, and they go and they had that experience and go back. So given the fact that we approach these sites with that baggage, and Lisa, you launched this provocative question that we should be educating people in a different way. What opportunities do you see for us to be introducing ways for visitors to these sites to learn different sorts of lessons? In what ways could our work help to begin to spark a critical understanding of the sites as opposed to just to, to, to be affirmative uh, and reinforcing the prejudices that, that um, um, that people carry with them. And by extension, how do we do that with ourselves? Because each of you is engaged in that very question. It seems that all of you have dealt with this in your own practice and that your work in each of these sites and, and, uh, has allowed you to move beyond your own education, the lessons that you learned, and to begin to open up new questions. I know this is a very difficult and very large subject, but you launched the, the, the challenge, so I, I would uh, like to hear a little bit more on that uh, because I feel it's a really important question, especially because what we get criticized as preservationists a lot for is for being affirmative, for continuing the, the, uh, the, the work of colonialism by other means, through soft power and so on. So how can there be a where, where is, what are the buttons that we might, in a very light, perhaps in an initial way, begin to encourage a critical culture within the discipline? Uh, mm. Well, you know, I, I do think about this a lot, and I, I don't know that I have an answer, but, you know, like many fields, we spend a lot of time talking to each other. And, you know, and we're also very quick to criticize tourists. There are too many of them. You know, we, we blanketly declare all tourists to be, you know, unaware of what they're doing to the site that they're visiting. And, you know, in truth, people are doing what, you know, is laid before them as an opportunity. And I, I think that, you know, whether it's the preservation field or whether it's you know, some consortium of fields that need to come together. I mean, I really think we need to find a way to get in front of the tour tourism industry in a different way. So, you know, there's groups now like Tourism Cares and all of these other NGOs that are out there. Um, you know, the World Tourism Organization. I mean, I think that we need, not in a strident, scolding way, but in a more positive way to say, you know, we could make the tourism experience better for people. At Angkor, there are 40 temples that nobody ever goes and visits. You could have an equally superb experience at any one of those temples. We've just learned through guidebooks that you want to go see Angkor Wat, and you want to see Tapram, and you want to see the Bayon. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of temples out there that nobody ever writes about. And so I think we need you know, art historians and others need to provide people with a broader range of materials. I mean, I say this about Rome as well. You know, four million tourists a year go to the Roman Forum. Maybe 100,000 of them climb to the top of the Palatine because they've been told to go and see the Roman Forum. And nobody says, well, there's this whole other fantastic part if you just take a 10-minute walk up the hill. And I, I think that we've become very siloed in the way we experience heritage when we travel. And, you know, and there's a lot of things that reinforce that, top 10 lists, 100 most important things to see in the world, whatever. And you know, I think through engaging materials, whether it's websites or whether it's um, educational opportunities or even working with tour operators and hotels in these other places, I mean, I think we could do a great job of telling people, yeah, sure, somebody arbitrarily said these are the 10 best things you should see, but really there's this whole other group where you could go all by yourself um, and not stand in line and not be told you have four minutes to see something. So I, I don't have you know, a, a specific answer, but I, I feel it every time I travel that we, we just need to do more 
to show people that there's a whole alternative range of activities they could be doing and they'd actually have a better time. Um, I have uh, just a quick uh, uh, question for Grace. You, you um, mentioned that, um, if I heard you correctly, that there's some influence of the Western point of view of being a little less interventive in uh, conservation activities, and that may be filtering its way back to the East a little bit. Where, um, is, could you expand on that maybe a little bit, and um, maybe how you might even fit into that picture? I think more commonly um, with Chinese paintings, for example, someone was talking about, um, I was talking to one of my former classmates about seeing an object and giving, where do you place its value? Is it because we tend, in the West, we tend to look at an object and its value is that it's old, that it has um, some sort of worth because of its age. But I think in Asia, there's this concept of the functionality of the object, which everyone had discussed in the architecture. Um, it's the same thing with Chinese paintings. There are objects that are meant to be handled, you know, unrolled and rolled. And so it's part of the life cycle of a Chinese painting that you would remount it every couple hundred years. Um, so it's very typical when you are studying in China to um, learn the mounting skills so that you can completely remount a painting. But you would never really think about um, doing partial remounting, for example, which is just if you had a large, um, a very long hand scroll, you might, not to, you might not need to remount the entire thing. That process would take a lot of time. You would need a lot of resources and a huge studio. So for example, Xiang Mei, she would be able to focus just on a section of the painting. And I think for us, that seems very um, possible. I mean, we would just look to you know, fix the damage right there. But in China, actually, they would more or less just remount the entire painting. You could just replace it with new materials. Um, they do reuse old materials if they're important, but um, if not, then they'll just replace it with new ones. So. It's a mindset, it's a thinking about how to approach the artwork. And I think even still here, um, because I've worked with most of the conservators who do Chinese paintings, um, I still think that it's something that needs to be um, taught. You know, that minor treatment and remedial, um, that remedial option, it's an option, that we don't need to remount things all the time. Yeah, good, thank you. I'm sorry, I, uh, Roz? what Lisa said and, and George. Um, you know, we've thought about this in our group and um, one of the things we would like to promote is really more interaction between the people that the, in the area and the tourists. For example, in ecotourism, you know, staying with homestays, they call it in the Philippines, homestays where you open up the house of the locals. It's not for every tourist, of course. A lot of tourists don't want that. but but to provide that opportunity and, and at the same time provide uh, income for the locals, you know, as much as you can do that, I, I think that will contribute to uh, uh, more exchange and understanding of the local culture. So uh, for me, it's, it's a lot more about um, interaction with the locals. That, that should come with the, with the tourism. I mean, as much as possible. Thank you. Lee. Um, I think there is an opportunity for that, but um, to go back to, to, to your question, um, one of the problems is that now in, in Angkor, there's, there's nearly two million tourists a year, and um, of course, we all want to have a richer experience and find the lesser seen temples and uh, uh, so on. But a huge majority of them simply don't care. They just want to see the three big temples and then maybe go to the lake, have a nice um, evening out and, and go on to, the, to Vietnam. And, and that, that is uh, common. And the, um, we have to, we, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people go and visit for different reasons. We have to offer the opportunity for the people who want a, a richer experience to, to, do, to have it. But uh, that's, that's not going to be a very large percentage of, of the tourists that, that are there. Uh, also, on a sort of perhaps slightly more frivolous note, I, it's true that um, uh, all the tourists go to the Bakeng between four and six. Um, but 
let them because that leaves it <laughs> for us in the morning. There's absolutely nobody there, and if we do spread it, <laughs> if we do spread it out thin, uh, then then there really isn't going to be anywhere left. So on a purely selfish note, I would keep that, <laughs> keep that quiet. <laughs> if I were you, we, we've built viewing platforms <laughs> yeah. so that they can be up there but not on the temple. So. Um, but there's an, there was another thing uh, about the community, and one thing um, a, a good friend of mine has just recently done a big tourism study, and he actually found something which I'd never seen before, which is a thing called the Irritation Index. <laughs> uh, and he did a survey uh, of... He's Cambodian. Uh, and he did a survey of the local communities and also the local restorers, funnily enough, to find out what it was that they found the most irritating about tourists. Uh, it was <laughs> kind of upside-down study, and it was very interesting. And all of them found dress and inappropriate behavior absolutely the top of the, uh, the irritation. And there, I think, there's a huge lesson to be learned. Uh, in you, you, you can't, you know, they say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can't force people to go and see the lesser visited temples, but you can force them to dress properly in a respectful way, uh, because that is not the case very much uh, in Angkor. And these are living temples, and they are Places uh, people are, get really upset by that. They need the nuns from Santa Cecilia standing in front of the monuments <laughs> to get them to dress <laughs> properly. Don't yeah. wash your feet in the fountain. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Actually, no. yeah. Go ahead, Grace. Um, just this might seem very simple, but I think that um, I see patterns in the visitors. For example, we we're just talking about China. Um, the experience of being a tourist, they didn't have the option to travel to many places, and so. Um, even in relationship to them being able to go to Taiwan, for example, I mean, the Palace Museum in Taiwan is over flooded with tourists just in the last few years. So, um, and when we have people from China coming to the States to visit our museums, for example, some of them are coming because they want to learn about our system, they want to exchange knowledge, but others are just coming for the experience to get mm -hmm. out of their country, to see new things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think just keeping that in mind as well uh, helps us to answer questions as, why are these people coming here? Who are they sending out of the country? For example, we have someone coming um, to work with us. And one of the reasons <coughs> why this person is coming is because they are on the older side. Um, they're one of the senior conservators, and they're going to retire. The opportunity to come out of the country through an institution is not going to be as easy. So they might not be the one who's the most trained or the most um, experienced, you know, who would be able to really add to the environment, not saying that that's the case here, but just keeping in mind that based on their ability to get out of the country in the past, that affects, you know, tourism. And yeah, definitely. And such. definitely. Um, maybe we'll finish up with, uh, with Lee, a question or a comment. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, that was very, uh, well-rounded and extremely informative and I just wanted to ask Grace also I think she's the only one today who's really talking about um, heritage that is very fragile and very personal and that isn't something that is experienced in a sort of um, geographic or bodily way and I was wondering if we could make the comparison of the sort of monumentality of the artworks that you're working on and the architectural monumentality that we're sort of all dealing with in a, a different sense. And is there a place to further discuss east-west east -west, uh, differences there? Because I think during your talk, you also reminded me that the word for conservation in terms of paintings I don't know how to translate painting conservation. I can't imagine how I would express it in the Chinese language. And I, I was thinking that your work as a Chinese painting conservator actually completes the job of the artist. So there is no such thing as a Chinese painting that isn't mounted. It's just not complete. It, it can't be really used or experienced. It's not finished. So in that sense, your work is very much that of the artist or as the craftsperson. And that was an interesting uh, distinction, I thought, especially compared to Western conservation of artworks, which, does a, which actually has a different function. So, yeah. And it also made me think of the fragility of these materials um, in comparison to, let's say, wood. I mean, wood is a commonly used architectural material in China, and it's, we see that it's replaced. There's almost no qualms about replacing it, and um, it's very fragile, like paper. 
Well, maybe that's a good place to stop. It's kind of the breadth of materials and their interaction with the environment. Um, so um, we're about to finish up. Again, Annie Berman ran the AV today. Thank you, Annie. Everything went extremely well. We, we got started slow, but everything went well from there. And again, Tricia and Charlotte, thanks for, for all your help, and, and particularly to all the, the speakers um, and to Ann Venning and for moderating this morning. So thank you very much, everyone.